This is from the website thewaythetruthandthelife.net. This is Wednesday, April 17th, 2018. Wednesday morning, I'm here in my Russian home and want to produce a video giving the background of uh, what's going on in Syria and the different worldwide forces that are engaged there and some background to understand. President Trump just authorized, along with France and England, three days ago, the bombing of what were said to be chemical production plants. Of course, there were no chemicals released, which is strange, but the false narrative, and I was yesterday uh, shocked wonderfully to hear somebody that had some insight into the truth, Rick Wiles. During the Six Day War of 1967, Israel seized Syria's land in the Golan Heights, Egypt's land in the Sinai Peninsula, and the Gaza Strip, and Jordan's land in the West Bank. The Israeli military has occupied those territories since 1967. The rapidly dwindling Christian population in those occupied territories, estimated to be 50,000, have suffered greatly under Israel's harsh military rule. The rancid rancor in the region is fueled by the resentment among Palestinian people that European Jews moved to the Middle East and seized much of their land in 1948 and have systematically taken over more land by building settlements for Jews moving there from Europe, Russia, and other countries. The bitterness appears to be ready to boil over. Israel views Iran as its chief enemy in the region. Both nations have become increasingly hostile toward each other in 2018. Israel claims it shot down an Iranian drone armed with explosives that was flying over Israeli airspace weeks ago. Israeli warplanes attacked Iranian military forces at Syria's T-4 airbase near Palmyra. The base was attacked again last Sunday, a day after the U.S., Great Britain, and France bombed Syrian facilities. Seven Iranian military officers, including the commander of the drone operation, were killed during Sunday's air attack. Israel has not publicly acknowledged its role in the bombing attack, but Syria and Russia have both accused the Jewish state of carrying out the bombing raid. Israeli intelligence is warning government officials that there is a high probability of an Iranian attack on Wednesday to coincide with Israel's anniversary celebrations. On Monday, a spokesman for Iran's foreign ministry said Tehran's retaliation against Israel will come sooner or later, and that Israel will regret its misdeeds. The Israelis gave news journalists a map of seven possible Iranian targets that Israel could bomb. Two sites were at Syrian air bases, where Israel claims Iranian drones are stored and operated. Another five air bases in Syria were on the list. Israel claims senior Iranian military commanders are stationed at those bases. The Syrian bases includes, include the Damascus International Airport, the T-4 base that Israel bombed weeks ago, and an airfield in Aleppo. Tehran's airport was also on the list. Israel claims Iran is flying weapons to Syria from the Tehran airport. The Times of Israel reported that IDF and Israeli intelligence sources told the newspaper that Iran would likely attack Israel with surface-to-surface -surface missiles or armed drones. Syrian anti-aircraft defenses shot down missiles fired at, an, at a Syrian air base in Homs late Monday and another base northeast of Damascus. Syria blamed Israel for the attack. The U.S. Pentagon said that there were no American military aircraft in the area. Israel has neither confirmed or denied that it carried out the attack on Syria on Monday. We need your prayers. We need your support. God's and God's why are blessing. we doing this? Why? Because Jesus Christ is coming back and there are billions of people who are lost, 
who are not saved and they need to hear the gospel. Amen. They need to be told that the time is running out to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. They need to believe on the name of the Lord. They need to be baptized. They, they need their names written in the book of life. That's why, Doc. Yes. Doc. And the other reason is God needs to be glorified. Yes. Amen. Amen. He deserves to be glorified. And for two hours every weeknight, we're going to glorify God. We're going Amen. to praise his name. Unlike anything else you've That's seen right. on Christian TV. And I'm doing this because I love the Lord with all my heart. And my, my greatest passion is for people to come to know Jesus Christ, Amen. to be born again. That's the sole reason that we're doing this. That is our motive. We also know it's likely that Israel's the one that carried out the attack on Saturday, too, right? Yes. So hours after the U.S., France, and Great Britain bombed Syria, Israel ran to Syria and bombed Syria, Syria, and, then, and, and killed Syria, Iranian, Iranian military. Killed Iranian military officers. Right. What do you think is going to happen? There's going to be a response by yes. Iran. I mean, what would you expect? But are the Israelis counting on Iran making an attempt to attack them? I think they want it. They've, they've, they've wanted this war for years. They've been trying to get, they tried to get uh, George W. Bush mm. to attack Iran. He didn't do it. They tried to get Barack Obama to do it. He didn't do it. Now they're trying to get Donald Trump to do it. And I think Donald Trump will do it. He, he, will, he will fall into this trap and fight Israel's war against Iran. But you were talking about the Golan Heights, and um, which... It, it, it used to be Syrian. Right. <laughs> it, yes. it was Syrian territory. Well, the UN says it's still Syria. Yes, That's... it's still Syria, but, but Israel's occupying it. Okay. Right. And, uh, and so, folks, you've got you to understand this. ISIS, the Islamic State jihadists, who have been in that area fighting the Syrian army. Oh, it's now, where who, the revolution began. Yes. Who's trying to kill the Syrian? I mean, who's trying to kill ISIS? The Syrian army and the Russians and, and the, the Iranians. Iranians. That's who's trying to kill ISIS. Who armed ISIS? The United States, Israel, Israel Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Okay. Yes. So along there in the Golan Heights, every time the Syrian army shot ISIS jihadists, the Israelis provided medical assistance to the wounded ISIS jihadists. Yes. That's not that's not speculation. That's yes, I get I get this. I read this in the Israeli newspapers. Yes. They openly talk about it. They they boast of it. They're you, proud of it. Humanitarian aid. Yes. They call it humanitarian aid. They, they're reaching out to uh, jihadists to show the world that, you know, the Israelis are kind hearted people. No, you're helping the jihadists who are trying to take down the Syrian government. Right. And you're providing medical assistance because they've been wounded by the Syrian army. And that's why Israel keeps bombing the Syrian government. People need to understand that if the Syrian government falls, Golan Heights is wide open. Yes. And, Syria, and Israel can make that final claim and say, see, this is ours now. And everybody although, wants a piece of Syria, remember? Although the, Israel will extend their occupied yes. borders beyond the Golan Heights. So go deeper into Syria. Right. You know, I was looking today at, at, a, at a map of the ancient kingdom of uh, the United Kingdom of, of Israel and Judah. And Israel in ancient times went up to almost reach Damascus. Right. Wow. That's what Israel wants. They're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until they get all that land right up to Damascus. Now, what do they have to do is they have to get a, a war started. So they they keep attacking Syria. They keep killing Iranian soldiers. And now I think you're going to see Iran punch back. And once this starts, you all know what's going to break loose. It, it's going to break loose. Yes. And, you know, we could be in a different world a week from now. And most likely President Trump will be uh, persuaded by John Bolton and others to jump into this war. And before you know it, you got an old fashioned barroom fight with chairs and beer bottles, uh, except they're going to be nukes. Right. Between Russia and the United States, Iran, In Israel, Israel, France, Great Britain, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Now, there is a report in the Wall Street Journal today that the Trump administration is asking 
several Arab nations, Saudi Arabia, is it Qatar, United Arab Emirates, That's correct. possibly Egypt, to put together an Arab army to invade Syria. Now, they tried this about two years ago. Well, I remember that. Remember the big ramp up of oh, 300,000 troops? 650,000 troops is what they were going to send in. And then it just suddenly died. But now, uh, when President Trump said last week, let others take care of it. Now we know what he was talking about. I need to add a note here on Russia's involvement in Syria. It's true. They worked hard to rescue and protect Christians in the Middle East there. The other part is they work together with Iran. That's because of the problem of jihad in Russia. As you know, the Chechens that blew up the Boston Marathon, the, the Russian Secret Service had even told the FBI about them, but they didn't do anything. They had escaped from Russia. The, the jihadists in Russia were setting up a caliphate in Dagestan and, and uh, uh, Chechnya. Uh, the, there's a large number of Sunni Muslims in Russia. They've blown up where we use the metro in, in, in uh, Moscow. The airport we use in Moscow, they blew it up till I think it was 68 people. The airlines that we fly south uh, um, from Moscow, two of them were blown up with women with bombs in their burkas. Uh, here uh, in Petagorsk bombings, they had uh, taking airplanes with hostages here at the Mineron the Bodhi airport that, that we fly into. At any rate, Russia has a real problem. There are so many Muslims in Russia that right now, with the young men have to take part in the military, there's more young uh, uh, Muslims than there are young Russians. Russia is trying to rebuild the family, but in the 1990s, there were more abortions than live births, and the Muslims have a birthing policy. It's expected that Russia will be a majority Muslim nation by approximately 2030. But after 9-11, there's been more than 100 Shiite mosques blown up in Pakistan. There's a mix of uh, Shiite and, and Sunni there, and they are terrible enemies. Uh, Persia, Iran is a Shiite mainly. They've, uh, they've been pretty harsh on uh, other groups also, including Christians. But the Iranian intelligence and the Russian intelligence work together on the problems of the terrorism in Russia and in Iran. And they so that then they're using the Sunni, uh, the, the, pardon me, the Shiite uh, uh, Iranians uh, and uh, against the uh, Sunni jihadists. It's that simple. They're working together for their own security. But uh, that's what brings Russia together. And the United States through Israel is working with Saudi Arabia and uh, the oil emirates, and they're having trouble. And, and I already have in another place of the hottest, they thought they'd go against uh, the Sunni, they'd, they'd go against Iran. Instead, they're fed up with the corrupted upper class in, in Saudi Arabia. The royalty is scared to death. <clears throat> so that's a whole another thing. If you read the Quran, it's a, it's a basis for a murder cult. First, the Arabs used it for rape, pillage, and plunder. Read Surah 8 and Surah 9. Then, uh, after they uh, devastated the Persian army and killed all but those that would uh, convert to Islam, that ended up uh, a Muslim, but being a more intellectual, and that they ended up in a conflict with 
the Arabs, and uh, they become what the, we call the, the Shiites. And then along comes Turkish invasions, murdering all the Christians and uh, taking over from the Persians and Arabs. And they find that they can do all this murdering and justify it if, if Allah is their God and the, they take the Quran. So you have Turkey, Iran, and the uh, Arab countries all killing each other and justifying it by the same God that said, if they don't submit, cut off their fingers and cut off their heads. So that's a little bit of insight. But what a tragedy that Christian Europe and America are working together with uh, one of these, uh, or two of them, Turkey and the, <laughs> Turkey's in the NATO. Uh, and and with the the Sunni uh, royalties and Christian Russia is working with the the murder cult based on the Quran coming out of Iran. Why? Why? I'll tell you why again. Why Russia works with Iran, the Shiites, because. Russia has a problem with the Arab-based Sunni Muslim, the same ones that are setting up the Islamic State. The, the, many Russian Muslims went to join that. But the Sunni Muslims have been murdering the Shiites. I've told you before, over a hundred mosques in Pakistan have been blown up, Shiite mosques blown up by the uh, Arab-based uh, Sunni Muslim. So Russia works together with uh, this part of the murder cult because they'll help with their secret uh, information and uh, secret police. They'll help with the Russians with the problems going on in Russia, keeping track of the Sunni Muslims there. So it, it's, it's an unfortunate thing, but they're working together against the common enemy. So what has happened to the Christian culture? Have you heard Bill Clinton degrade the, the, the Crusades where they tried to get their land back and were uh, murdered? Uh, because they fought back, they're the murderers. Now you have the Buddhists in Miramar fighting back, and so they're the murderers. But Listen to what Obama said. America is no longer a Christian nation. And he used the Bible to degrade Christianity. Use the one against the other to destroy the Christian culture is part of that homosexual abortion, gay marriage, uh, international agenda. Because women's liberation and homosexual liberation and abortion and gay marriage are an international agenda that is taken over Europe and America and in now Australia and the breakdown of the home, women's liberation, women being raised in daycare so they can't even give a nursing bond to their children and the autism is going up. On one side, you have Islamofascism and on the other side, you have women's liberation with abortion and homosexual marriage and child deprivation with autism and all of the rest of the problems that come with it. But now let's get on with the... He wants Saudi Arabia, Egypt, United Arab Emirates and Qatar to send troops into Syria to occupy Syria. And we see the relationships that have been built in the past with Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And then just, was it last week where the Emir of Qatar was mm -hmm. with uh, the president, visited CENTCOM in Florida here? I mean, the Emir of Qatar visiting a, a major military uh, post here in the U.S.? What does that tell you? That there's a deal that's obviously been made here. Yeah. There's so a fight coming. Okay, so uh, the Wall Street Journal mentions possibly Eric Prince yes, is involved uh, in this operation. He actually commented on this report on Monday. And what he said is he's been reached out to by 
said Arab countries. He didn't name them, but he said Arab countries have reached out to me for possible uh, consultation to help put this together. But he hasn't uh, commented if he's going to be involved yet. He's waiting to see what President Trump does. But as Doc said, President Trump has actually made this pretty clear already that he doesn't want United States troops necessarily to be the, the ground forces in this invasion. Instead, he wants that, that alliance, the GCC, that group. Remember the, the weird orb all those people got together and put their oh, hands on? Oh, and they're all laying their hands they're, on the orb? That, that group, the orb holders, are the ones <laughs> the that orb. they want to use to basically run mercenaries. I mean, Rick, think about this for a second. Did they really back off of that invasion plan in 2015? What is the Free Syrian Army? The Free Syrian Army is in part funded by Saudi Arabia. Oh, yes, absolutely. But, they, but not, not 650,000 yeah, 650, men, 000. all right? So we may have Eric Prince and a private mercenary army funded by Saudi Arabia. But you really, you go back to it. That's who has funded <laughs> ISIS. Yes, yes. Saudi Arabia, the United States, Israel, they funded ISIS. ISIS is a private Arab army. That's exactly That's what, what it is. All it is is a bunch of of demon-possessed killers that the U.S. rounded up and gave weapons to to go in and attack Syria. You you mentioned Eric Prince. You remember his uh, plan he pitched last year? He wanted to basically have a privatized version of uh, mercenaries controlling our army in Afghanistan. Remember hearing about that? Well, it turns out that Eric Prince, in part with another man who's recently made the news, Elliot Broidy, the deputy RNC chairman who was tied in with President Trump's uh, uh, lawyer. Who, Michael Cohen. With yes. Michael Cohen with a $1.6 million payout. Now, Elliot Brody apparently pitched a very similar plan uh, to this, this move to build an army in, uh, in Syria, actually in October of last year. But it was to build an army in Afghanistan. Right. What he did is he claims, this, this was, we found out about this from leaked memos that he blamed on Qatar, mind you. But in the leaked memos, he said... In coordination with George Nader, Circanus, which is a private military firm, and uh, a, a couple other uh, former military officials, that he wanted General McChrystal to head a initiative with all the countries you just mentioned, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, to launch a new invasion into Afghanistan. Now, what it appears has happened here is they've shifted they've, and said Afghanistan pivoted. is not where we want to put an army. They've instead all now agreed it's Syria that is the place we want to fund and launch this initiative. Did anybody ask the Syrian people if they want to be invaded by a coalition of nations? Of course not. And so, in fact, they, the only, P, only nations that have been invited in Syria are Russia and Iran. That's it. Officially asked by the Syrian government, come and help us. Yes. Everybody else is an invader, an occupier. <laughs> now, Doc, he, let me he, ask you, go ahead. Who's, well, he mentioned a name that uh, in the course of all of our investigations over the past few months has popped up, and that's George Nader. Does that name ring a bell to you? Uh, um, no, I just, the only name I know Nader is Ralph. And I well, think, uh, George is he, Nader, if George, is he Ralph's brother? No, this is a whole different one. George Nader was in this meeting. He was also in another meeting with Eric Prince in the Seychelles Islands. January 2017. Okay. okay. So, but George Nader has uh, a questionable history. In fact, he has been charged with pedophilia not once, but several times in various countries. Ooh, and what, what is his? All right, so you, you're certain he's been charged? Yes. Well, yes. Pedof- uh, according to pedophilia. AP, he was convicted in 2002 in the Czech Republic on 10 cases of sexually abusing minors. He spent one year in prison. 10 and, cases? 10 cases. And, and what is his involvement? So his involvement is to a meeting with Eric Prince in February or January rather, of last year in the Seychelles and also with Elliot Broidy to organize that plan to launch an army into Afghanistan. That's George Nader's role. And what is his job? What does he do? Is he, is he he's a broker between the Middle East players. He's and a broker? Kind of a, a broker between the Middle East players and what's happening in D.C. Deep okay. ties with the United States. Okay, so I go back to why do I always say that the ruling political class of America is the perpetual war corruption, sleaze, and pedophilia party. And Mr. Nader's history goes way back to the Clinton days. In fact, he's been to Jeffrey Epstein's island several oh, times. Oh, really? And has been photographed with him and several other friends with, with Jeffrey Bill Clinton, Epstein. With Bill Clinton in the pool on Lolita Island. Oh, I'm shocked. And I'm so, just shocked. Once again. The pedophile party. Right. The war and pedophile party. Folks, we need to pray for this nation. We are evil. We're evil. 
there is an evil force that's controlling this nation yes. Yes. and taking this nation down. That's, that's what we have to pray against. But we have to pray that the rest of the body of Christ will open their eyes and spiritually discern the wickedness that is around them yes. and begin to pray against this thing and break this spiritual stronghold. Let me ask you this. Why are Israeli warplanes in Alaska and why are they leaving Alaska? Well, they were going to be part of a joint training drill. First of all, did you know that Israel actually trains with our Army or National Guard? Sure. They sure do. Well, and our audience may not know that, but they do on a regular basis. Well, they, they also train Homeland Security and, and the TSA. And, and all, also local police officers, too. So, What was interesting about this, they called it a red flag drill. I'm not exactly sure why they called it red flag past that this is a, a term for uh, combat. But they, they said here... The, the scenario they were, they were training on is to operate in snow, ice, and harsh weather. Why would Israel need to train in snow conditions? Is that a war in, in Russia? That's the only thing we can think of. So Possibly a war in Russia. Hey, I, after hearing Rick, I went to search for him on uh, YouTube and found an announcement that YouTube had barred him from uh, and, and removed his videos. Uh, I think with the problem that Facebook is having uh, with uh, Congress that uh, maybe they put uh, Rick Wiles back. But then uh, this uh, John Little from uh, OmegaShock.com ridiculing uh, Rick Wiles as if he was an antichrist. Unbelievable. This type of thing goes on over and over if somebody says the truth. But let's get on with the problem and we'll work through. Welcome. I'm John Little and this is a special report from the Shockcast of Omega Shock. OmegaShock.com It is with a heavy heart that I must turn to doing yet another special report. I do not like doing these. In fact, it would be better to say that I hate doing these. Because I would only do them when there is sin and deception within the body of Christ. And there is nothing that gives me more grief. Furthermore, we are required by God to reprove and rebuke those who sin while claiming leadership within the body of Christ. 1 Timothy 5, 17-20 So it is with great sorrow that I must call out Rick Wiles of True News. <clears throat> Special Report, Rick Wiles Deceiver I truly detest the need to do this, but the danger to the body of Christ compels me, and the command of God propels me. God was speaking to us when Paul wrote this to Timothy, verse, starting with verse 17 of Timothy 5. Let the elders that rule be well counted, excuse me, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And then in verse 20, Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. 1 Timothy 5, 17-20 And that last verse is why I'm speaking to you right now. Satan has convinced far too many to ignore this commandment, but I will not. The health and safety of the body of Christ is too important, and that means that this code of silence must end. Please understand that hiding the sins of the elders is the way of Satan. It is an evil thing that has been used to corrupt the church, and it must stop. I will do everything that I can, when I can. To make this clear. Of course, this means that you must call me out for rebuke if I also sin. Here are two more lies. Rick writes, quote, 
I was saved in 1978, I can tell you that there was no dot dot dot. I mean absolutely no mention of Zionism in the churches I attended. Hyper-Christian Zionism became noticeable in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Today it is out of control in many Protestant evangelical churches in America. Sadly, the false doctrine is spreading into other nations as American missionaries take it abroad. Close quote. Lie number six is a bigger one. My church in the 1970s and 80s was Zionist. I certainly was a Zionist. Countless numbers of Christians were Zionist. My dad was a Zionist. In fact, Israel figured out very early that the Christians were Israel's biggest support. Someone that I knew, who has since passed away, related a conversation that he had had with Prime Minister Menachem Begin. He had asked the Prime Minister of Israel why he went to the Christians first every time he visited the U.S. Begin's response? Christians are the ones who truly support us. I paraphrase that one since I do not remember the exact words. It was Christian support that made Israel possible. The Christians were what made Israel a reality. Without the Christians, there would be no Israel, and the Israelis knew it and still know it. This is yet another lie on the part of Rick. And we aren't done counting lies. Rick, your lies condemn you. This next one is a whopper. Quote, it is vitally important for you to know and understand that Zionism is a radical political movement to empower power Jews to dominate the world. Close quote. Rick, that is such a stupid lie. I don't know where to begin. Seriously, Israel's purpose is to dominate the world. That was the purpose, really? That was beyond stupid. Anyone who listens to you has got to be stupid if you claim to believe something this ridiculous. Rick, you are a liar. And it seems that you want us to believe that you are a moron. Rick Wiles can only be full of extreme spiritual darkness to do and say what he has done and said. Rick Wiles, you are not only a liar, but a rebel against God. With all the lies above, this next one seems meaningless by comparison. Quote, there are millions of Christian Zionists in America who do not know anything about Zionism. They have been indoctrinated with propaganda that contradicts the Bible. Close quote. How wrong! And what a lie! Christian Zionists know everything that they need to know about Zionism. Yes, there might be some of them that have parts of the idea wrong. But they are so far ahead of Rick Wiles that it's impossible to measure. You are lying, Rick, and you need to repent. Lie 10. I'm surprised at the number of whoppers that Rick is telling. So here we are at number 10. Quote, How many times per day do you hear Christian Zionists say, The Bible says that whoever blesses Israel is blessed by God, and whoever curses Israel is cursed by God. They say it multiple times on Christian television and radio. They say it every Sunday in many churches. They say it every day in social media platforms. It is a key phrase in their Zionist cult mantra. The Christian Zionists wag their finger in your face as they admonish you to dare not criticize Zionism. Bad, bad, bad. You're going to be cursed if you say something critical of the Zionists. Don't you want to be blessed? If you say yes, only good things about the Zion if if yes, say only good things about the Zionists. Close quote. Again, John Little is an accuser. He's straight from Satan, the accuser. But the truth is what Rick Wiles is saying, that Israel is working together with Saudi Arabia. It has a, a, a core of anti Christian, but will manipulate Christians. And here's what I, how I, I have a personal friend. He died last September, but he was a devout Christian, had the organized uh, uh, the church uh, schools for, uh, for young people and so forth. Uh, he was a Bible banger. You talked to him and you had the, the verses the way he said them or you were in trouble, but he was sincere. And he was bedridden for seven years after he got uh, 
the infection when he had a, a hip replacement that, that uh, the name of it I can't uh, remember that infection it's now a problem that they can't cure but he got that in they took out his uh, replacement hip and he never you would never left bed after that but he laid there watching these Christian evangelists and I'm talking to him I've lived in Russia uh, six months of the year for the last 20 years I've got Russian residency he taught Bible he taught Russian with uh, English, spoken English in the Russian library, children's library with a broad, uh, 30 some, uh, New Testament English Russian Bibles. And uh, I don't know Russian, but the children would read the verse in Russian and then read it in English and it helped them pronounce the English. At any rate, I was uh, coming back and forth. I come to Russia spring and fall, three months each time. I have to be here six months of the year. So four months, four times a year, I'm flying across, and there's always these uh, wealthy Jews uh, either using Aeroflot to go to Israel or using Aeroflot to go to Moscow and then into Ukraine. There's a an Orthodox saint, a Jewish saint that many Jews visit. Uh, if you don't know, I'll tell you, there's more, uh, the, the more wealthy Jews in Russia than anywhere else in the world. The oligarchs mainly are the Jewish. They were the core of the uh, communist revolution and they took over the, uh, the wealth of the nation and actually set it up largely as a private corporation. You've heard about it. It's true. And, and here, all this Jewish wealth and, and when I was teaching uh, high school physics and math in the, in the 80s and um, early 90s, and all of a sudden, the, so many uh, the, uh, ba uh, so many Russian students there, and the, the, they built uh, had a Baptist church, Russian Baptist church, and uh, they were getting free welfare and everything. It turns out that Israel wouldn't wanted the Jews to come from Russia. And the Russia had all this intellectual class of Jews, uh, t teachers and lawyers and everything, and all the wealth that they had accumulated. They didn't want them to go. They had received a free education in the communist system, and they were an important part of the communist structure. Russia didn't want to let them go. So what? The, how did Israel get America to help them? Oh, the Orthodox were trying to, part of the rebellion against communism within Russia was to reestablish the Russian Orthodox Church. And here were all these home Christians and Baptists and Pentecostals. Get them out of here. Russia made a deal for America. You take our Pentecostals and Baptists and home church people and we'll let the Jews go. That was the deal. Look at the, look at the, uh, well over a million all of a sudden come, and New York State was giving them welfare with, uh, they made special deals that, that ended up closing, but they, uh, they could get access to the university. It, it was amazing. I had a number of, of and they were nice people. And uh, with the, the ones that kept their hair covered, you know, with a bandana here, working in the supermarkets and all over. And uh, the very nice students, too. At any rate, here, Phil tells me how he's got to donate all his money to help those poor Jews come from Russia. And here is uh, these uh Mega churches now, where it's an entertainment center, they're not talking about you give your life to God and get out there and serve God. They're, they're entertainment, blah, 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 and, and fear and that, and do something good. Help the Jews. Bring Jews from Russia. Give your money. And that's a, we need to help these poor Jews escape from Russia. And Phil gave them a bunch of money, and it was a total lie. And this man, this evil accuser, is part of that propaganda nonsense. Pardon my anger, but that's why I'm writing this video. Jews are very smart. This is something everyone agrees on. Growing up Jewish was like living in an incubator in order to maintain the high temperature of this popular perception. For instance, 
If I ever said something stupid, I was pounced on by other Jews as having a goyish cook. That is, thinking like a goy. And we have lots of role models today who think like Jews, not goys, and get lots of attention from goys. See what I mean? She's a superstar! Justice Ginsburg, thanks very much for taking the time to sit down with us today. You've been working on issues of women's rights, gender equality for your whole career. As you look back, what have you accomplished over the course of your career? I haven't accomplished anything alone, but I was fortunate to be part of a, a, of a revived feminist movement starting in the late 60s and I was a lawyer uh, with a talent that could contribute to that to that effort. Talent? Well, yeah. Jewish lawyers have talent for getting the intended verdict. For instance, a Gentile acquaintance of mine told me he got ripped off in a business deal and was looking for a good Jewish lawyer. He suddenly switched his story, saying that the person who ripped him off was Jewish and that a Jewish lawyer wouldn't quite fit the bill. <laughs> so you'll get a Gentile lawyer, I asked. I'm forced to, he said. <laughs> well, sounded like he was settling for second best, since Jewish lawyers got the smarts. As dean of Harvard Law School, you did two things. You hired some conservatives, which is a good thing. And you opposed military recruitment uh, which I thought was uh, inappropriate, but we'll have a discussion about what all that really does mean. It's a good example of what you bring to this hearing. A little of this and a little of that. Now, what do we know? We know you're very smart. It's assumed from the start. She's Jewish. She's smart. Now, um, as we move forward and deal with law of war issues, Christmas Day bomber, where are you at on Christmas Day? Senator Graham, that is an a undecided legal issue, which, uh, it, the, uh, well, I, I suppose I should ask exactly what you mean by that. I'm assuming that the question you mean is uh, whether a person who was apprehended in the United States is... No, I just asked you where you were at on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like all Jews, I was probably at a Chinese restaurant. Uh -huh. Jews crack smart jokes, too. And, of course, don't celebrate Christmas. Jews celebrate Hanukkah. The White House celebrates Hanukkah, too. Earlier this week, President Trump hosted his first Hanukkah reception as president at the White House. His family was also in attendance. This is 20 Minutes. Of course, this is not the first Hanukkah for the Trump family. <clears throat> uh, Jared Kushner... Uh, is a Jew, and uh, Trump's daughter uh, married, converted to Judaism, and married her. Uh, that's Ivanka. And the two, Jared and Ivanka, had uh, access to the White House inner daily briefings, even, and Jared had shared some of the uh, American uh, Secret Service briefings with. Uh, agents of other countries like Israel. Now he hasn't uh, got the security clearance, so he's been removed from that access. But uh, Ivanka is said to have uh, brought Trump to bomb Syria the first time by being the one that presented uh, pictures of uh, babies that were purported to be uh, poisoned by the Syrian government. Well, I know for a fact there are a lot of happy people in this room. <laughs> Jerusalem. Thank you. And Milani and I are thrilled to welcome you and so many wonderful friends to the White House. We wish you a very happy Hanukkah. 
And I think this one will go down as especially special. Baruch Ata, Melech HaOlam, Shechianu, Vikiyamanu, Vihigianu, Lazman Hazer. We'll now proceed with the lighting of the Chanukiah of the Menorah. I will light the Shamash, the top light, and then the President's grandchildren will kindle the first light, heralding symbolically the upcoming first night of Chanukah. As soon as the President's grandchildren light this light, uh, please join me in singing uh, the first stanza of one of the most uh, beloved of Hanukkah songs, which is Ma'oz Tzur, and I mean please join me because we do not want to subject the President and the First Lady uh, to my own singing. So, uh, so all those who know, please join me. I will light the Shamash. And then you take the candle. Great. Just, you know, yeah, there you go. You got it. You know, Kushner's children come from a mixed marriage. Kushner's smart. He's Jewish. He's got an office in the West Wing. That's pretty smart. Ivanka, I don't know. She doesn't look Jewish. We don't hear much from Kushner these days. Is he on his way out? But he's very smart. Very well connected with other very smart Jewish people. His dad, Charles, is also very smart. He bankrolled Trump's campaign from the start. Giving bucks to Manhattan hacks is a very smart Jewish thing to do. But let me give the background here of why uh, the United States, Britain, and France independently decided to bomb Syria. The uh, friend of Iran, which is the enemy of uh, the Saudi royalty, they've uh, murdered the chief Shiite imam. Uh, the Saudi royalty had the chief Shiite imam beheaded uh, last year. But, uh, and uh, also the enemy of Israel, because uh, Iran is uh, supporting Hezbollah and uh, Syria is uh, using Iran for protection against <clears throat> their Alawite are uh, similar to the Shiite uh, Muslims <clears throat> and they need the protection of the Shiites from the uh, Muslim Brotherhood that had overthrown Assad's father, Yobamur, tried to, and Assad's father uh, rescued the Alawites and the Christians. The Muslim Brotherhood is, was uh, putting Christians on crosses, cutting their heads off, as they have been doing now in this last uh, thing set up by uh, Hillary Clinton as they overthrew uh, Gaddafi and set up for the Muslim Brotherhood to get the, his weapons to use uh, against Syria. And we'll, we'll get a little more depth, but let's look at the more immediate things that led up to the decision in Washington, London, and, and uh, France. Of course, understand France and England set up these borders and, and kingdoms uh, in, in uh, the Arabian Peninsula and that that area, and uh, took away the uh, any homeland for the Kurds and split it up between Turkey, or Iran, and Iraq, but uh, and set up a, a, a guaranteed problem. That the, the problems would be there anyway. We'll talk more about that. But let's get into what what just happened the, to bring this bombing about. MBS is the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. He's presiding over a horrific war in Yemen. Jets from Saudi Arabia and the UAE are refueled by the United States and the United Kingdom on a daily basis, in fact. Um, 
there was a resolution put forward by Bernie Sanders, Chris Murphy, and Mike Lee, a tripartisan effort to cut off support for this murderous campaign that has targeted civilians, that has bombed hospitals, that has led to a cholera outbreak. Um, we had the, uh, the Devil's Row in a vote, video, I believe, was posted of nine Democratic senators who joined Republicans in voting against it. Uh, some of the ones that come to mind were Chris Coons, uh, as well as Bill uh, Nelson, uh, and of course, seven others. MBS is also a major instigator against Iran, uh, a funder of far-right and terrorist proxies in Syria, still upholding a blockade on Qatar. Uh, but he's been given a lot of very positive press coverage in the United States, both because he has been making some modest but positive social reforms in Saudi Arabia, specifically, particularly with regards to women. His anti-corruption campaign owes a hell of a lot more to do with consolidating power than any actual effort to rein in the corruption of the kingdom. And he has an incredibly, and of course the Trump administration and the Saudis, a bunch of brain-dead oligarchs with no regard for human life would have a tight relationship together. So here is Donald Trump speaking with MBS in the White House. They met together, and uh, as you'd imagine, Donald Trump is going to boast about deals. Become very good friends over a fairly short period of time. Uh, I was in Saudi Arabia in May, and we are bringing back hundreds of billions of dollars into the United States, and we understand that, and they understand that <laughs> some of the things that have been approved and are currently under construction and will be delivered to Saudi Arabia very soon, and that's for their protection. But if you look in terms of dollars, $3 billion, $533 million, $525 million, that's peanuts for you. Should have increased it. $880 million, $645 million dollars, six billion dollars, that's uh, for frigates, uh, 889 million, 63 million, uh, that's uh, for various artillery. Some of the things that we're now working on, thanks, thanks. and that have been ordered and will uh, shortly be started in construction and delivered, that system, 13 billion dollars. The C-130 uh, uh, airplanes, the Hercules, great plane, $3.8 billion. The Bradley vehicles, that's the tanks, $1.2 billion. And the uh, P-8 Poseidons, $1.4 billion. And what it does is it really means uh, many, many jobs. We're talking about over 40,000 jobs in the United States. So we make the best equipment in the world. There's nobody even close, and Saudi Arabia is buying a lot of this equipment, and a lot of people are at work making the equipment, not only for us, because we, as you know, we, we're getting a $700 billion military proposal, and that's even a lot for you guys, but we're getting a $700 billion military plan this year, and $716 uh, will be next year, $716 billion. So we're... Uh, we really have a great friendship, a great relationship. I would really have to say the relationship was, to put it mildly, very, very strained during the Obama administration. <laughs> and uh, the relationship now is probably as good as it's really ever been. And I think we'll probably only get better. So that's actually true. It was strained during the Obama administration. Why? Because President Obama and John Kerry pursued uh, the Iran deal, which the Obama administration partially as to try to offset that, uh, also facilitated and allowed for the Saudi campaign in Yemen, which has killed civilians indiscriminately, but also supposedly targets Houthi rebels, who they claim were a proxy force of Iran, but in fact, were a more independent operator uh, from the Iranians than before the so Saudi intervention there. There's a much broader history here. This is another actually great example of then, you know, of of Trump actually really fitting a history. U uh, US foreign policy. We're the biggest arms seller on the planet. 
We make an enormous amount of money selling munitions overseas, including, of course, the governments like Saudi Arabia, uh, who, who use them uh, to, to, to harm many. Deal with long-term problems in the MENA region, all of which Trump, of course, is increasing, along with MBS, who is a lunatic trust fund baby in his early 30s, who is fighting a direct war in Yemen, instigating a proxy war in uh, Syria and filling it. And of course, all sides of the war in Syria, other than the Kurds, are complicit in mass killing, mass indiscriminate slaughter with the highest body count owing to Assad. That doesn't obscure that, but there's no doubt that the far-right Salafist factions backed by Saudi Arabia are uh, also far-right, indiscriminate killers and murderers with a reactionary agenda, to say the least. This man is ignorant of a very important aspect of what's going on in the Middle East. There was a major war between Iran and Iraq, many slaughtered. That's when the uh, supposed gassing of whole, not supposed, whole villages were killed by chemical Ali. So here's Iraq with a minority Shiite uh, population, and Iraq is in war with uh, Iran, uh, and, and America sponsoring Iraq and others sponsoring Iran and mass killing. Okay, that war came to an end. Saddam Hussein basically brought uh, Iran to its knees. But then destroying Saddam, Saddam Hussein left Iraq with a, a whole bunch of military weapons that America put there. And here, the, the Sunni majority was the enemies. And the uh, Shiite minority were the ones that overtook the government. And what, what to do? Well, let's, let's uh, let the uh, Shiite minority uh, have control of... Uh, of uh, Iraq, and uh, then then they'll uh, will but we'll leave these weapons there that they uh, the, the the Sunnis will attack the Shiites and uh, they're both our enemies. So let them have the weapons and fight another war between Iran and Iraq. Well, that isn't the way it went because of one fundamental thing: the uh, fundamentalist. Sunni Muslims have learned through modern communications with Facebook and, and all these things that they, they use them, the social networks, they know the Saudi royalty is corrupt. The homosexual prince that did murder and uh, they got caught on a camera in, in uh, England or, and is in jail, that this the, the corruption of the royalty of this this governing system of royal families that France and, and, and England set up back in the early 1900s. Um, it's, a, it's a crime against humanity because nobody's really faced the problems of a, of a murder cult where a book that says cut off their fingers and cut off their heads, which is used by the Arabs <clears throat> as uh, Sunni Islam and used uh, by the, the Iranians. Uh, the, the, the Iranians had a... I'll take a minute to give you a little background there because <clears throat> Islam grew out of... Uh, Judaism about 600 years after Jesus, but Muhammad led caravans and learned from the uh, Jewish merchants that he was driving. He learned about the um, Jewish Bible and that the Jewish Bible justified uh, killing where the uh, Moses put Joshua in, in uh, charge of uh, protecting the people. And there was a 
tribe that was murdering the Jewish, and it also did child sacrifice and human sacrifice. It worshipped the god Moloch, and and uh, uh, Joshua uh, had a revelation that uh, we exterminate them all. Don't take any property. Don't take their women. Don't intermarry with them. None of that. But go and dis and destroy this uh, murder cult. And they did. They exterminated those people. Well, Muhammad heard that and he realized he could use this God uh, to justify him in rape, pillage, and plunder. We'll do it because it's a service to Allah. And if you read the later, sur the, there are nice surahs. At first he thought the Christians and Jews would all follow him. But then when uh, he had the, the, the fight with his own people, he had gone off with rape, pillage, and plunder and killed the men if they didn't join him and take their women. But he built an army of those that would submit, and he come back and had a battle with his own tribe. And the Jewish Koreza tribe didn't help him. And, and they, he personally beheaded hundreds of them, personally. You can read about it, it's a, but it's a matter of history. And he turned against the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. Uh, Christians that believe in the Trinity cut their heads off. That's a, that's a three-part God. You can't do that. Uh, but <clears throat> so he turned against, he had the surah of abrogation, that all those nice things don't count. Allah can come with a, with a new uh, surah, and it's superior to the old ones. And the surahs like surah 8 and 9 are not overwritten. That's where it says if they don't submit, cut off their fingers and cut off their hands. <clears throat> of course, I don't want to get too distracted, but uh, this ethnic pride that can be used to murder other people took over the Jewish faith and used it for Arabic expansion. And they fought the Persians, a much more higher developed culture. Uh, uh, they came from the west towards the east, going into Persia. And at the time of the battle, there was a terrible sandstorm from their back. So it was in the face of the Persians and they destroyed, devastated the Persian army, murdered all that they could. They went on to murder any men that wouldn't submit to Islam. That's how Iran got converted, Persia got converted to Islam. Only those who uh, would submit were left to, to live. So they ended up with... Uh, uh, another uh, form of Islam. Following, they had, they had a language, written language. The Arabs didn't even have a full language; they had a few characters. But here was the Persians with an a, with a, a full alphabet and a written language and libraries and everything. And they were putting the Quran, which was carried on by memorization. They were putting it into writing. Oh, the Arabs went ape against the Persians and uh, developed uh, their language, putting extra dots over this, making more letters out of the few that they had so that they could have an alphabet to, to write the Quran. And so they wrote it in their uh, fancy invented alphabet and made it a crime to, to uh, take it, uh, the, the teachings of of Muhammad from any other language. That's the basic language. And uh, you know, at any rate, I got a copy of the Quran from the University of Michigan. You know, Michigan is has a, a great many Muslims. It's, there's whole towns it's not safe to admit your Christianity in. But that's a whole nother thing. So this background, and then you had the Turk uh, invasions with um, murder, rape, and uh, plunder. The, in, in Russia, the, they uh, took over a million and a half, murdered over a million and a half, and took a, a, over a million and a half slaves and sold them to the, to the Muslim Caliphate. And uh, the, the Turks 
uh, uh, one group of Turks, the Tartars were different. One group of uh, Turks had come into Turkey. That was the land of the seven churches. They've murdered all the Christians. It, Christianity keeps coming back. It's 1%. And they're murdering the Christians, just like they have a preacher in, uh, that's given his life to preach Jesus for them. They have him in jail now, and, and I think 30 years they sentenced him to because the imam, which didn't preach the murder uh, in in uh, Turkey, uh, went against Erdogan, and they're blaming him for the effort to overthrow the uh, Erdogan dictatorship. He, uh, and he's got refuge in America, so they're holding this American preacher now, with their family and a, a fine uh, man, they're holding him hostage to try and get that imam that they want to they want to execute from America. But so many things going on. I'm sorry to get uh, distracted, but there's so much ignorance. I don't know how to deal with it sometimes. But uh, let me uh, just stop this and and uh, pick up on the narrative that we're involved in right now. Let me inject here. I did support uh, the senior Bushes <coughs> joining with Saudi Arabia to uh, put down Saddam Hussein and bring him to trial, not because of the false narrative of him having secret uh, nuclear weapons, but be, I supported that war because he was giving $25,000 to the family of every suicide bomber. The first Iraqi war only got him out of the oil emirates and the second one is where he was and then executed. But I supported both wars for the reason of him giving money to murderers. And of course, there was a competition between the Shiites and the Sunnis who's supporting uh, the best except the, the Saudi royalty was not alienating the Jewish. I, I don't know if you know it, the Jewish and the Muslims have historically worked together. They, you can find many uh, Orthodox Jews that are against Israel because they lived in peace in the Middle East before the creation of Israel. But in New York, there's a group of ultra-Orthodox Jews who are devoted to the Palestinian struggle. And as Marina Portnaya discovered, they believe an end to the state of Israel is the only solution. Every rally, every demonstration, every opportunity to voice opposition. Judaism, yes! Zionism, no! The state of Israel must go! A particular chorus of Orthodox Jews joins forces with the loud choir of Palestinian supporters. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! The collective voice is otherwise known as Notori Karta, ultra-traditional Jews religiously opposed to the creation and existence of Israel. It is like a tumor to us. It is. It, it has latched itself onto us, this terrible, evil movement of Zionism, which is the ideology behind the state of Israel, and it is hijacked and stolen the Star of David. According to Rabbi David Weiss, Jews were exiled from the land of Israel because of their sins. Notori Karta worshippers believe restoration of the land should only happen with the coming of the Messiah. Until then... We are forbidden as Jews to have any sovereignty, even in an uninhabited land. According to Notori Karta, Israel and Zionism are in direct conflict with the Torah. They campaign for Israel to be dismantled and the Holy Land returned to Arabs who originally occupied it. Notori Karta can best be understood within the confines of East Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which comprises the largest community of anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews in the U.S. An inclusive neighborhood dressed in traditional modest clothing, defined by large families of up to 12 kids. Here, you speak Yiddish, eat kosher, pray three times a day, and display no flag of support for Israel. 
Rabbi David Feldman says activism plays a strong role in the religious life of Notori Karta Jews, and this includes meeting with leaders of Muslim countries. They have no problem mm -hmm. with Jews as Jews. They can live, they can tolerate Jews, they can live with, with Jews, and they can host Jews with the greatest respect. Mm -hmm. they, they do have a serious problem with occupation, which uh, we happen to agree with. An agreement that has raised eyebrows. Members of Notori Karta have spoken several times with Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who they call a peace-loving leader. We warm, respect. They've publicly praised Turkish officials and even traveled to the country last year, visiting injured activists following the Israeli raid on the Gaza flotilla. <laughs> Very often, overseas demonstrations against Israel have turned violent, from London and Montreal to the Middle East. A bloody and bruising backlash has transpired. Critics have classified Notori Karta Jews as extremists, and Israel supporters deem them as traitors. Even here in New York City. You're embarrassing Judaism. You're a piece of shit. With the black jacket, with your long girl. Rabbi Weiss is familiar with the dangers that surround Notori Karta. We must be ready to give our lives to this. It is very, it's not easy. A life devoted to their faith, even if it means facing contempt every step of the way. Marina Portnaya, RT, New York. And in the 700 years that the Muslims ruled Spain, their main uh, rent collectors and enforcers uh, in with their small uh, Arab population amongst the Christians, they're enforcers and, and uh, they couldn't have ruled without the Jewish. The Jewish prospered. It was a wonderful period for Judaism in Muslim Spain. But uh, and that's where a lot of the problems came uh, the, the, when the Catholic Church started, uh, got, got control about the same time Columbus discovered America, and they started bringing these uh, Jews that had been part of the uh, murder of Christians and the, the, the occupation of a Christian land, they started bringing them to trial. So uh, many were rescued by Turkey, sent, uh, there was a Turkish caliphate, sent ships, uh, and, and there were uh, a couple hundred thousand Jews in, in Turkey until the the uh, creation of Israel when they went there and Turkey turned against uh, the Jews at that time. But uh, a number of the Jews escaped to uh, northern uh, Germany where the Jews served uh, the ruling oligarchs uh, there and uh, as their rent collectors and they didn't want to the, the oligarchs didn't want their children to be doctors and lawyers and, uh, and they didn't want their serfs to be uh, literate. So they had the Jewish uh, who were literate to be their doctors and lawyers, rent collectors and enforcers in northern Europe, the same as uh, the Muslims used them in Spain. So they fit in very well. And of course, it, uh, it, uh, the anti-Catholicism of, of, uh, that they assisted, of course, there had been a war between uh, Sweden and uh, the Thirty Years' War where Gustavus Adolphus was killed and his, uh, his lesbian daughter gave up New Sweden in America. Tinkham, Pennsylvania was where the first legal or civil marriage was made. It was a Swedish marriage, but that part's almost lost from history. But at any rate, the ignorance here of this man not understanding the background, I just wanted to interrupt. Thank you. But the basic premise there of uh, sitting around with a Saudi prince and bragging about how many weapons you're selling him is very U.S. and harkens back to George W. Bush walking around holding hands with King Abdullah. What might be slightly different is that MBS has apparently personally boasted that Jared Kushner is in his pocket. <laughs> I would imagine it's incredibly easy to get Jared Kushner in his po in your pocket. Uh, it's you... working and it's very exciting. That was MBS. <laughs> MBS is the same voice as Jared Kushner. 
It's like, the Saudis tried to get me in their pocket, and it's working, and it's very exciting. Uh, I'm going to just quote briefly from The Intercept. Uh, Alex Emmons, Ryan Grimm, and Clayton Swisher. Until he was stripped of his top-tier security clearance in February, presidential advisor Jared Kushner was well-known around the White House as one of the most voracious readers of the president's daily brief, a highly classified rundown of the latest intelligence intended only for the president and his closest advisors. Kushner, who's been tasked with bringing about a deal between Israel and Palestine, was particularly engaged by information about the Middle East, according to a former White House official and former U.S. intelligence professional. In June, Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman ousted his cousin, then Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, and took his place as le- next in line in the throne, upending the established line of succession. In the months that followed, the president's daily brief contained information on Saudi Arabia's evolving political situation, including a handful of names of royal family members opposed to the Crown Prince's power grab. Kushner made a trip to Riyadh in October. And, of course, it can't be exactly, you know, sort of established what he told uh, uh, MBS in that meeting. But apparently the crown prince has told confidence, confidence, and I'm quoting now again, that Kushner discussed the names of Saudis disloyal to the crown prince, according to three sources who have been contacted with members of the Saudi and Emirati royal families since the crackdown. And uh, one of the people MBS told about the discussion with Kushner was UAE, UAE Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed. MBS bragged to the Emirati Crown Prince and others that Kushner was, quote, unquote, in his pocket. That information could very well have overlapped with mass arrests, and it also could lead to deaths. So these are the sort of people that we have in MBS's pocket. Now, please understand here, Saudi Arabia is working together with uh, Israel. Israel is the underground big bear here with its nuclear weapons and threatening to use nuclear weapons on Iran because Iran is threatened the death of Israel and is supporting uh, even Sunnis against uh, Israel, and as well as Hezbollah. But Jared Kushner married Ivanka Trump. She had to convert to Judaism, give up her Christianity before she would do that. And there is an, an open record that Ivanka Trump is part of the inner team of advisors along with Jared Kushner who has been removed because of a lack of security clearance but he uh, took uh, America's secret uh, knowledge uh, and and shared it with the Saudis and the uh, Emirates but it's a matter of record did Ivanka took pictures of babies into President Trump uh, uh, to convince him of the first bombing of Syria. So there's quite a bit going on here that is under the carpet. And Israel is a big bear here, and it's working together with the Saudi uh, royalty and other royalties there. And the the fundamentalists in Syria that they thought would turn against Iran, that that the royalty wants against Iran because they're having trouble uh, in the Emirates and other places with the with the uh, Shiites wanting democracy. They Shiites have majority in some of those minor states, so it's a big problem. They want they thought that they that the Sunnis would go against the Shiites there in Iraq if they got the American weapons left. And instead, they set up a caliphate, and there is much against the corrupt, worldly, uh, despicable behavior of many of the Saudi royalty. And the, the, the royal, the, they're a corruption of even Islam. And so the, they end up being the enemies. The, the Saudi royalty now has to work with Israel and America for their own sense of safety. Remember, 
George Sr. went and took American troops into Saudi Arabia to help push Saddam Hussein back. And they exterminated the whole village of Americans because even the two main cities in Saudi Arabia, it's a death penalty for a non-Muslim to set foot. Wake up. Human Rights International has become homosexual marriage and the right to kill fetuses or even partial birth abortion. Wake up. Home and family values are so important. On one side, you've got Islamo-fascists, and on the other side, you have the homosexual and, and, and uh, abortion liberation movement but breakdown of the home and the children that need a mother. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. The red carpet has been rolled out at Buckingham Palace and number 10 Downing Street in London for Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The 32-year-old became heir to the throne after a palace crisis last June. And since then, he's continued his country's involvement in the war in Yemen, launched a blockade of Qatar, and began what his government calls an anti-corruption drive. Dozens of high-profile princes and businessmen were arrested and held in a hotel accused of corruption. His trip to the UK is the first since he took on this new role as crown prince. The UK relationship goes back a long way. Colonial Britain helped establish what was to become Saudi Arabia over a century ago. There are extensive business ties with Britain, a major arms supplier to the kingdom. Reports suggest that deals worth $100 billion could be signed during this visit with the UK, eager to deepen business relations outside the EU. But the visit has brought strong criticism and demonstrations as well over Saudi human rights abuses and the humanitarian catastrophe caused by the conduct of the war in Yemen. British Prime Minister Theresa May has defended the welcome given to Saudi Arabia's crown prince. We'll get to our guests in a moment. First, though, Jamal Ashayal reports from London. Mohammed bin Salman started off his UK trip with a visit to the Queen who hosted the young prince at Buckingham Palace, a sign of just how eager the UK is to bolster its ties with the Saudi Kingdom. Children from the Saudi-owned King Fahad Academy were bussed in to cheer on the Crown Prince. A continuation of the massive PR campaign that included huge adverts across London announcing bin Salman's visit. Human rights groups, however, chose to focus on children by highlighting the killing of thousands in Yemen by the Saudi military, an army under the direct command of MBS, as he's known. We've got 11 million children in Yemen who are dependent on humanitarian aid. That's the entire population of Belgium. This is the world's worst humanitarian disaster. So for all the trade deals, for all the niceties, we have to remember that Saudi Arabia is a key player in this conflict. The Crown Prince's visit is a very controversial one. In Parliament, the leader of the main opposition party, Jeremy Corbyn, questioned the Prime Minister on what message she would be conveying to Mohammed bin Salman. As she makes her arms sales pitch, will she also call on the Crown Prince to halt the shocking abuse of human rights in Saudi Arabia? Her response? The link that we have with Saudi Arabia is historic, yeah. it is an important one, yeah. and it has, yeah. Saved, yeah. it has saved the lives of potentially hundreds of people yeah. in this country. To build on that relationship, the Prime Minister left Parliament to meet with MBS at Downing Street. Prince Mohammed, when will you stop bombing innocent civilians in Yemen? When will you stop killing innocent civilians in Yemen, Prince Mohammed? As you can see, this trip is not just a high-profile one, but it's also a very controlled trip with the, both the British government and the uh, Saudis uh, not wanting to have clear access. There is no press conference that took place. This is the closest we've had to access to the Crown uh, Prince. And the big reason uh, behind that is the widespread opposition and criticism uh, that uh, has been accompanying this trip. Part of that opposition was demonstrated in this protest outside Downing Street. Organizers here say the UK government should not be turning a blind eye to Saudi human rights abuses, no matter how much the Crown Prince pledges to invest. They want their politicians to demand real change and reform in Saudi Arabia, and not to cheer on what they consider to be propaganda aimed at polishing the image of a man who's locked up many of his political opponents. Jamal Al Shayal, Al Jazeera, London. If the answer to address concerns about 
Mohammed bin Salman and some of the choices he's made and his age, et cetera, is not to isolate him, but rather to still engage him. How do you engage him in a way that can actually make a difference? I mean, Theresa May says that she did bring up the, the issue of Yemen. Does anybody really have any leverage with these types of issues when, when dealing with Saudi Arabia? Well, I'd, I'd like to think that if we're supplying Saudi Arabia with arms that are effectively killing thousands uh, of, of Yemenis and destroying the entire nation, then we do have some leverage. Um, uh, I, I agree entirely with David's earlier assertion that this trip is about uh, Britain doing trade, um, uh, particularly looking at the post-Brexit era, and uh, Saudi Arabia through Mohammed bin Salman, who actually carried out, uh, let's say, a white coup within the Saudi family, looking for legitimacy on, on, on the international stage. So I, I believe that there is trade to be done, but uh, from our point of view, uh, trade unconditionally is something which is absolutely unbefitting of uh, Britain and its claims to upholding democracy, to upholding human rights, to defending liberties and the such, uh, when uh, actually he's talking about an ally that recognizes uh, none of that whatsoever. So I, I think that there is leverage to be had. I, I, I don't um, accept uh, Theresa May's assertion uh, or claim that uh, this relationship has somehow uh, saved uh, so many lives, as she said. What we do know for sure that uh, we have indirectly uh, contributed towards Saudi Arabia actually killing thousands of innocent people in Yemen. So, so I, I think there's, there's much to be said on that particular front. I'm not sure this president really understands uh, the, the details uh, or the value uh, of the relationship, other than I, I you know, alluded to in, in dollars uh, and cents. And that's why he made his uh, biggest uh, mistake. Uh, it, it's amazing. But there are a lot of similarities, uh, the rash personalities, uh, the lack of experience. Yes, I, I think both are in common between this administration and the regime now led uh, by MBS. David Khalil just brought up um, a topic that obviously we do need to get to, that it was very, very soon after Donald Trump's trip to Saudi Arabia that um, the blockade of Qatar happened. Um, is there any reason to think that once Mohammed bin Salman gets to Washington, D.C., that the State Department and Donald Trump will be on the same page to perhaps pu push him to, to do something about this blockade. The State Department has had one consistent position, and Donald Trump's has been um, a little bit all over the place. But what, what do you expect to come out of that? Well, just to add to what Khalil said, and I think it was really important that he talked about the moral bankruptcy of the West, because there's a really a political crisis going on really in Europe and America at the same time as there is a series of crises in the Middle East. Um, the other similarity between between uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman or, or, the, or, or the House of Saud, as it is now run, and the Trump family, it is two families running two administrations. Uh, it is almost like the sort of um, Saudification of uh, Washington that's taking place. He has a direct line, uh, bin Salman has a direct line to uh, Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Now here again, uh, Khalil will, will, will confirm this. Kushner's uh, fate in the in the White House is now getting is now less certain than it was. So all of these things are enormously un unstable uh, foundations on which to build a relationship. As far as Qatar is concerned, there's been very little movement that I can tell. I think the prime mover and behind uh, the the blockade on on Qatar has been uh, the Emirates. Um, and uh, who uh, Mohammed bin uh, uh, bin Zayed, who has been really the mentor and tutor of the 32-year-old Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, um, and as long as those two stay together, um, and as long as they see eye to eye, and I think there may be a time there are possible scenarios in which they do split apart. Um, I think the siege of Qatar will continue, and you will have such statements which um, Mohammed bin Salman said just before he came to London. He said it in the company of an Egyptian uh, TV host that Turkey and Iran form uh, a triangle of evil. If you look at Saudi Arabia and the state of Israel, they actually have some quite deep-seated similarities. It's their close alliance with the United States, high amounts of weaponry purchase, and 
their uh, shared disdain for Iran. Also, both of them have ties particularly in religious fundamentalism and religious radicalism. Well, Israel and Saudi Arabia are essentially the same kind of country. They're artificial creations of the British and now American Empire. They both were, in fact, created by British imperialists. The name Saudi Arabia was invented by a mid-level British bureaucrat. I forget his name. Uh, and the country was carved by uh, British bureaucrats and created out of nothing by British bureaucrats. Likewise, Israel was also created by the British after the Rothschild family dragged the United States into World War I uh, on, in exchange for the promise of Palestine from the British government. So these are both imperial uh, colonies in the Middle East and they are key occupation posts that keep the Middle East occupied and terrorized. So You've got to remember as the Turks invaded the Middle East they not only exterminated the Christians they also took after converting to Islam, took control and dominated the Persians and the Arabs. The, the Turkish Caliphate uh, was the threat to Europe, uh, dominating and, and controlling Spain and Portugal for 700 years and uh, all the wars that went on uh, in Kosovo and, and uh, Albania and, and the, the, the Turkic invasions of Russia and the Balkans over and over and the Turkish uh, killing of the Christians, that uh, they are not friends with uh, the Arabs. They forced the Arabs out of their dominant place in the Islamic world for a number of years and are a common enemy. There are three Islamic uh, areas that are not friendly, except maybe to work with one and another against another for a period of time. But the, the inbred conflict between Iran, uh, the, the Arabs, and the Turks. But maybe it was the thinking of the a British Empire to set up Saudi Arabia in a way that it would be strong enough to be a, a, a force against Turkey who was an enemy of uh, the West in World War I. Uh, the, the Europe and America defeated uh, Germany and Turkey in that war and that's uh, where gave rise to these agreements they're talking about. According to a Christian Science Monitor article a couple of years ago, uh, the Saudi, or rather the Israelis, have cost the American taxpayer trillions of dollars. Uh, likewise, uh, the Saudis use their oil money, which is completely unearned, to buy political influence in the system here. And together, the Israelis and the Saudis have teamed up with extremist forces in the American military and to some extent in the uh, Christian community here in the United States to push through these incredibly destructive policies in the Middle East that have also affected the U.S. Trump actually blamed 9-11 on Saudi Arabia while he was running for president. Today, he's been forced to recant from that by mm -hmm. the Zionists who essentially own him. So the, this neo-colonial puppet in Saudi Arabia, which is now more a puppet of Bibi Netanyahu than of Donald Trump, but they're all pretty much puppets of the same masters. Whether or not that's true, the interests of the Zionist extremists in Tel Aviv and the Wahhabi extremists in Riyadh are precisely identical. Both sides know that they cannot possibly survive unless the region is in flames. This is what Oded Yanon, the Israeli geostrategist, said back in around 1970-something. He said, we're going to have to smash up the region, balkanize the region along sectarian and ethnic lines by fanning the flames of sectarian and ethnic tension and break up these countries so that Israel can keep expanding. Uh, and of course, the hardline Zionists say that Israel's 
borders are the Nile and Euphrates rivers. So they're depopulating the parts of greater Israel that they're planning to steal from okay. neighboring countries. I've got a lot of other issues that I want to go through, but I, I want to jump. We only have about three and a half minutes. The, the raid that special counsel Robert Mueller did on uh, Robert, is it uh, Mr. Cohen? Uh, Michael Cohen. Michael yes. Cohen. Yes. The personal attorney of President Trump. And they seized the attorney's private records of his clients. Yes. I have never heard of this in my life. I'm, I'll be 65 years old this year. I have never heard of the FBI raiding a lawyer yes. and seizing a lawyer's client records. Yes. That's unheard of in a constitutional republic. So now Mr. Trump's enemies have his attorney's records, and not only Mr. Trump, but Mr. Cohen's other clients. Yes. Well, Elliot Birodi that we just mentioned here a few moments ago. He's one of them? He yes. is one of the clients. He's one of the clients. He's yes. one of the clients. And we now know that Sean Hannity is somehow uh, a, an official or unofficial client well, I guess official because Sean Handy held up a $10 bill last night on his program and said, this is what I gave to Michael Cohen. So there's some relationship there. Why is that important? He gave him a $10 bill. Because that established a relationship, an attorney-client relationship there. He didn't have An to exchange. give him a check. He didn't have to give him a deposit of $20,000, just $10. That's just, enough. I need your confidence on this. I need anonymity on this. But now Robert Mueller has whatever Sean Hannity told a lawyer in private. Okay. Yes. So... The deep state, the dark state, is taking down Sean Hannity. Right. They're going after everybody who opposes them. Yes. And, and they're using the most crooked, corrupt means. I mean, the FBI raiding a lawyer's office and stealing, just literally stealing a private files that have nothing to do and they didn't with just, any criminal investigation. And what gets me is they didn't just take the president's files. They took the files of every client that Michael Cohen that's right. had. Every that's right. client. Uh, that's, that frightens me. I mean, to think if I had an attorney and somebody else had some bad dealings with the attorney or they got in trouble, that the feds could come in and take my records from my attorney and I had nothing to do with it. That's what scares me, Rick. That's right. You know, <laughs> uh, my critics who say, well, Rick, you've been, you've been saying for years you know, that the U.S. is going to implode. Folks, it's already imploded. Yes. Do you, do you not understand? It's already imploded. This kind of stuff does not happen in a constitutional republic. Right. We, we are now, we're a banana, we are a nuclear armed banana republic. There is no rule of law. We're in a lawless state now. And we have thugs in control of the FBI, the Justice Department. President Trump does not even have control of the Justice Department. The people in the Justice Department do not listen to the president of the United States. That's right. We don't know who is obeying his orders. And the Russians and the Chinese are seeing this. They're watching this. And they realize the United States of America is falling apart. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm telling you that as the body of Christ, we've got to pray and intercede Amen. that God holds this thing together and that these people in high places with, who are wicked and evil, that their schemes and plots will not come to pass. Pray for us at True News. We're doing our very best to tell you the truth, and we're doing our best to expand this program to two hours. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.